unfortunately, there's a good proportion of practitioners who don't take the business side seriously or therefore put in naive fees, optimistic fees, and then just work weekends and evenings to balance the books. Episode 138. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking to Peter Farrell and Stephen Brookhouse, who are the co-authors of the Good Practice Guide for Fees, recently published from the RIBA. Now, Peter Farrell is a senior lecturer at the University of Liverpool, where he is responsible for professional studies as well as being a studio tutor on the BA and MArch courses. Prior to his current position, he was a partner in a small multidisciplinary practice in Chester, specialising in the education sector. Stephen is currently the Professor of Professional Practice in Architecture at the University of Westminster. He's a chartered architect with over 30 years experience uh, as the director in a commercial practice and professional teaching. So in this episode, we discuss what brought both of them together to write the book on fees. And we look at some of the issues that practices face around percentage fees and why percentage fees typically and traditionally don't really work. Um, We discuss the importance of negotiation in determining fees. Uh, We look at how fees should reflect the risk that the architect is taking on and why it's important to specialise in a niche and how that influences fees. And we also talk about profit and surplus. We also have a special link for a discount code for our listeners of the podcast who wish to purchase the good practice guide fees which is included in the information of this podcast so sit back relax and enjoy peter farrell and stephen brookhouse this podcast is produced by business of architecture a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals this episode is sponsored by smart practice business of architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Peter, Stephen, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you both? Very well, thanks. Um, Very well, thank you. Excellent. Well, fantastic to have you here. A quick sort of recap on both of you. I know, Peter, you're now a senior lecturer at the University of of Liverpool. You've worked for large practices. Um, You're a partner in a small multidisciplinary uh, practice in in Chester. And Stephen, you're now a professor of professional practice at at Westminster, I understand. And you've you've been a chartered architect for 30 years. And recently, you guys collaborated together and you put together this fantastic book called Simply Called Fees, which is out by um, on the Reba Publishing. And I suppose my first question is, what was it, what brought both of you together to, to write this book? Why did you feel that it was, it was needed? Um, well, um, Stephen and I um, do quite a lot of lecturing and uh, funnily enough, we, we got together out in Hong Kong um, as, as a result of that. Mm-hmm. And we put forward a proposal um, to the RIBA for a series of CPD lectures on the subject of fees. And we kind of divvied up these uh, events all around the country. And as a result of that, we got a tremendous amount of feedback from the delegates. And it was really on the back of those lectures that we were then asked to put this fees book together. Mm-hmm. And of course, we've been able to incorporate a lot of that information that we gathered from practitioners uh, into the book. No, I think, uh, yeah, as Peter's put it quite uh, quite well, I think it all, like many things, it started over a drink, really. Um, this happened to be a drink in Hong Kong when we were doing lectures um, for the uh, part three course out there. Um, and as Peter said, we... Um, put together a proposal, then we put together um, a CPD mm. program, and it was clear that there was a demand for for more information um, mm. uh, that would continue the discussion. And and we'd also realised we tapped a nerve, I think, with practitioners yeah. who um, had a huge variety of uh, ways of calculating a fee. Mm-hmm. Um, and a general feeling that people weren't very satisfied with um, 
the current way that uh, fee proposals were uh, put together. It's interesting. I mean, we know at Business of Architecture, when we, ever put, when we ever put any content out that has the word fees in the headline, that it's always sure to be a hit uh, and people are always interested in it. What are some of the, you know, what are, what are the problems that architects are facing with their fees, either pro- writing fee proposals or actually, you know, collecting fees? Okay, so traditionally, architects have calculated fees on a percentage basis. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, originally, there was a there was a fee scale, and you weren't allowed to compete with each other. And so this is a very sort of comforting uh, procedure for architects. And they, they sort of feel they know where they stand with their percentage fees. And many clients also um, feel they they are a useful barometer for them. Um, But of course, they're a very crude um, way of calculating fees because there's no actual link between the expenditure uh, involved mm. in uh, delivering a job and and the revenue that you're you're going to receive. I think uh, Stephen and I were, were quite surprised in our CPD sessions, which were predominantly to smaller practices, yeah. that the majority were all calculating their fees on this percentage basis. Whereas in the research we did for the book, most larger practices would calculate them on a resource basis and if necessary uh, convert them back to uh, a percentage fee if that's the way the client wants to see it or they want to do a a sort of a a sanity check Um, so i mean the point that we make in the book is that what's crucial is to set out your scope of service um, and, and what you're going to do and what you're not going to do so that that provides a sort of a baseline for any future discussions that may be, be necessary as the job progresses, because every job we do is a prototype and very often things change. Actually, I um, tended to be more provocative. As Peter has rightly said, who, who generally used percentage fee scales, I used to say at our CPD events, has the percentage um, method of uh, fee calculation served you well? <laughs> and I think the universal answer was probably no. Um, uh, and there are all sorts of things bundled up in that, as Peter's mentioned, Mm -hmm. but generally a lack of transparency. Um, The clients don't fully understand um, the connection between um, the delivery um, and the fee. Um, But also it's more complex today that we um, deliver a range of services. We don't all deliver exactly the same services. Um, it's not a cookie cutter approach. We we live in a, a world where we're doing uh, partial services um, uh, at either the front end or the uh, stage five or four. Yep. Um, so it's not that helpful in terms of identifying um, what the appropriate fee is for a job. Um, and although I think earlier you said that, of course, anything with fees um, uh, attracts your attention, when, when we discuss this with the publishers, uh, you know, I, I almost wanted to put in a, a subtitle, uh, and the subtitle would be, it's all about time, um, mm. uh, or it's about time, uh, because um, I wanted to provoke practitioners into thinking that maybe it's time to change things, but obviously time is our key resource as well. Uh, so, so, so are you saying that the, well, going back to what, what Peter was saying as well about that the larger practices are kind of traditionally, or, you know, they're kind of, perhaps they've got better project management systems in place, or they're able to kind of have a tighter eye, if you like, on what resources are being used on a project that they're able to kind of more accurately predict what their fees and what resources are needed. But this is still, you know, w- w- the architect is still selling time. Is there, is there a way out of that? Or is that, is that what we are selling? We are selling time. Well, we're, we're selling time, but that time has value attached to it as well mm-hmm. at different stages in, in the project. Um, and your point about large practices is, is a good one in that perhaps they're, they're better at managing their resources. Or, um, but I'd say the jury was probably out on that in some ways. Right. Um, that large projects and large practices tend to manage inefficiency, uh, mask inefficiencies as well. 
Um, but it's revealing from the data that's gathered by the um, RIBA each year that, that not all practices, and that includes large practices as well, monitor their time in terms of uh, keeping um, comprehensive records. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seemed be, to be particularly prevalent as well among small practi practitioners and sole practitioners. And that's something that came out uh, when we spoke to practices in, um, in the sessions we did, that there was um, a lack of understanding about the importance of, of recording and monitoring your time because you know this is one of your key resources. Yeah. Um, I suppose it goes back to our education as much as anything else that we're almost encouraged to work um, uh, more than other students in other disciplines. Um, and I think that that's uh, a theme that runs through practice. Um, Again, that's that's very interesting as well, because, you know, I, I speak to lots of practices and, you know, often they won't have a measurement on time, except for they know that it's a lot, a lot of time that they never feel that the amount of time that they're putting into the design is not being, you know, compensated enough. Um, and it's not uncommon as well for architecture practices to really want to over deliver, if you like, on the design because that's what we enjoy doing. That's why, that's why we're here. And then we end up, you know, you, you take a, a, a small terraced house in South London and the client hasn't necessarily, they know they don't always have the fees for the design that's provided, but the architects are very happy to over deliver, if you like. And that kind of has a lots of different impacts. Are you, were you seeing that a lot with, with practices? I, if I may, Peter, I think so. And I'm interested, it, it, it's something that is ingrained. I mm -hmm. actually was um, taken by something I was reading in the last um, RIBA journal, which uh, was a profile of the practice, up and coming practices. And there's one in particular saying there's always a struggle in the execution. Um, it takes hard graft, persuasion, and resolve. And that can mean doing more work than the fee can reasonably sustain. Mm. So, you know, people are aware of this. But then, of course, people do it for other reasons. Sometimes they want to do it too because they want that project in their portfolio. Yep. Um, and um, they're willing to take um, the pain, if you wish, for, for potential future gain. But uh, the point... That, that, that's, a, that's a decision that people can take. But the point we want to make, I think, is that you need to be aware of what the scale of magnitude is. Um, and especially in the current climate, you know, the effect on people's well-being as well. But, but essentially, it's about understanding the value of the resource you, you commit to a project as well. Yeah. And Peter, I, 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 your, think, your yeah, I, think, I think the flip side of, of this discussion is putting the book together. We did quite a lot of research with people who were prepared to share their fee fees with us. Mm -hmm. um, and those practices who predominantly worked on percentage fees, particularly some of the guys in the commercial sector, who their clients did not take kindly to them going back and saying, you've moved the goalposts. Can we have a little bit more money, please? Yeah. These people admitted that their profitability on those jobs could vary by 10 or 20 percent and so some of the jobs would definitely be making a loss and they ran their practice just simply by keeping an eye on the fact that there were more winners than losers now the point that Stephen and I make in the book is that this isn't necessarily a very good business model mm -hmm. for small practices who haven't got that overview, who haven't got some jobs that are making absolute fortune, they really need to make sure each job delivers or, you know, um, that you know when there is an issue that you can go back and, and have a discussion with the clients about the fact that things have changed and therefore there's got to be some consideration of additional fees. So, so what's the importance of, of negotiation in determining the fees? and the importance of how to set the contract up powerfully so that you're able to 
you know, obviously expand your fees when needed. Because the, the, the bizarre situation that architects find themselves in, you know, is that you're essentially you're setting fees and making an agreement about a complex project at the point in the project where you know the least amount of information about it. I think that's right. And, and where you get uncertainty, you get risk. And so really the, the point about negotiation, I think, uh, and this was an area that uh, we expanded on um, in the book, is that, first of all, to assume you're in, in competition with um, other architects, but it's more importantly to, to know your value. Um, it's also a process that doesn't just start at the beginning of the project, it's continuous. And as you mentioned, you know, and as Peter's just mentioned, uh, clients don't like people going back, asking for more, um, especially if it's unforeseen or if it's a, a surprise. Um, but some of that, it, it, some of negotiation is about listening to your client and what's important for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it is about, in a sense, um, understanding where those risks lie because as you say it's a very um fluid part of the project at the point where you're negotiating your fee so you have to have a clear idea about the resource you need to allocate to that the value that you add um the profit you may wish to um gain from the project that you can reinvest but also the risks associated with it and those could be um, the risk of a new client. And, and it may not be reflected in financial terms as such, but you may, for example, um, be concerned about their finances and also their commitment to a project. And, and one legitimate position is to ask for an advance payment. It's, it's not um, just the architectural profession. It's a lot, lots of professions do this, uh, the legal profession as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's one point. But also where clients are asking you to take on more responsibility, to take greater risk, possibly linked to the planning um, aspects, then you should charge a premium for that. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, really, risk is, is, as you say, it's about uncertainty. And if the scope is ill-defined, um, then you ne need to price for that if you're... Um, giving a, a lump sum quotation for a fee or to make sure that you have the scope to renegotiate um, as the project develops and the scope changes. Yeah. I think the difficulty we face as architects is very often that even quite expert clients don't really know what we do and they're not quite sure what they're paying for. They tend to wear you up on your track record or, you know, your personality or how many jobs you've done of that type. And so to set out what we're going to do and possibly give them a range of different services from which they can, they can choose means that any negotiation, if there is to be negotiation, then we can also discuss well, what scope of service do you actually want? Mm. And this is something where it is, it is actually possible to do. But um, it's, it's difficult um, because, as you know, our job as an architect is, is very complex, particularly if you're, you're covering a full service. Yeah. It, it has, has the industry as a whole kind of let go of, you know, you know we, we look, if we compare ourselves to other professions, for example, like the culture in the legal profession where lawyers, you know, they're kind of notorious, if you like, for charging by the hour and, you know, you pick up the phone and you, you're aware that that 17 and a half minutes is going to get billed for. Um, whereas architects notoriously are not like that at all. And, we, you know, we, we find ourselves competing against all sorts of other industries. It's very difficult to distinguish between, you know, even architectural technologists and an architect. It's difficult to distinguish between different architectural practices. Some practices have got way higher overheads than, say, a two-man band who's operating out of the, out of the kitchen. Um, but all of this kind of leads to a, a huge amount of, you know, mystery around what the what fees should be. So, 
what what would be your advice for the industry as a whole for or for kind of our governing institutions of how to be approaching this well i i think the first thing is to realize where we have skills that nobody else else has mm-hmm. uh, i'm i'm in education now full time education even though i run a practice for many years and so i observe these boys and girls come through the system incredibly skilled and committed people and by the time they start practicing they do have many many skills and some of those skills will allow a client to get a planning approval where perhaps that might not be possible with a less skilled person um there may be logistical skills that they have or just simply in terms of problem solving and listening certainly even young practitioners um are very good at the coordination and the overview and people take these things for granted and it's really important to be aware where we have unique skills and those unique skills add value and therefore it's possible to charge for them and stevens alluded to the schools of architecture where these things start from mm-hmm. and of course in the studio it's very much a a culture of you know all nighters and you know doing whatever is needed to produce that that wonderful design mm. and there's not a great deal of chat about money thinking about money and certainly not profit yeah so there is an, a need to both think about where we add special skills and also the fact that we're a business and that clients expect us to be able to talk money steven do you have anything to to add on to that yes if i could just add that i think you you mentioned um uh, other professions and i think one thing that the struck us when we were talking to practitioners as well as of course our own experience is that it is a different sort of relationship right um it's uh, it's long term it's got many facets to it it um is quite different piece meeting that you would have with a lawyer or accountant yeah um it, it's quite fluid as well and of course that works can work to the client's advantage and it can work to the client's uh, disadvantage, but also probably predominantly it leads to a sometimes a level of informality uh, with time stretching. Um, and that's where we need to be things because there is great value. And as Peter said, they, clients don't always understand what we do. Yeah. Um, but that, is in our gift. You know, we, we can communicate that more effectively, I believe. What, what, are, what are some of the constraints or how, how do we go about communicating what it is that we do more effectively? How, how might this look like from a, from a practical standpoint and, and from some of the, the businesses that you've interviewed that do it well, what are they doing that other practices aren't doing? Well, I think I'd start by saying it goes back to this idea of identifying the value that you can contribute at, yeah. at the different stages of a, of a project, articulating that, and then um, then adding a cost um, to that. Mm. So I think we're all pretty clear anecdotally about where we add value to a project in its general sense, but not in a financial sense. And one thing that came out of the practice sessions um, and uh, when Peter and I were writing the book was that there we had different levels of value at different stages of the project. And of course, as Peter said, you know, there are areas where perhaps we, we don't differentiate ourselves from um, more technical delivery um, consultants. Um, such as architectural technologists, um, and, and we don't need to, but we just need to be aware that that the value we contribute at those stages is perhaps lower. So to help rebalance this, I think you've got to identify where that value sits and then, then begin to articulate it and then work out how you then communicate that to clients. Uh, I think that's only fair. We can't sit back and say, People don't understand our services, as Peter's rightly said. Yeah, um, we have to go a step further and then communicate that better. Yeah, 
And then we have a responsibility to manage it better as well. I think the other thing which has been interesting, um, both Steve and I do um, examining, part three examining, and we're, we're sort of privileged to read a lot of case studies from practices all, all around the world, actually. Um, and so that gives us quite a lot of information about how different businesses are working. And what's interesting is there are people out there who set out their stall to deliver quality, to charge a sensible fee, and they have clients who come to them because they believe they're delivering a service and they're mm. prepared to pay for it. it. It's really quite interesting and heartening when you, you read about the, these, these people. I think going back to your question about messages to the profession, I think, you know, this whole business about being business savvy, mm. being prepared to stand up for what you believe is right and what you're worth yeah. And avoiding this, you know, rather strange race to the bottom that we're all involved with is the trick. And it's my belief that, unfortunately, there's a good proportion of, of, of practitioners who, who, who don't take the business side seriously or therefore put in naive fees, optimistic fees, and then just work weekends and evenings to balance the books. And it just is not a very clever thing to do. It's not clever, particularly when you think of the debt that students have incurred in becoming qualified. And, and many of these people are incredibly talented uh, yeah. and, and conscientious. Yeah, it, it's, it's really, really interesting. I mean, I, you know, we have the, the, the privilege of speaking to lots of practices all around the world um, and the kind of the, the huge amount of hours that architects often find themselves working to delivering, delivering projects and the constant race to the bottom with fees and sometimes it's you know it's actually I, mean, I was chatting to a, a practice in Los Angeles recently and they were surprised at some of who some of their competitors who are very well-known architects were putting in some very low ball fees uh, to to win to win projects now that's going to be the case I suppose you know in every every business people are going to try and win win on kind of the lowest the lowest fees if you like but that kind of doesn't really help the industry as a whole um what are the skill sets that we need to be able to communicate like in terms of selling like how do we you know are, are there any kind of pitfalls that you're seeing architects falling into in terms of how they're actually selling and marketing themselves that means that they're not able to command the higher the higher fees that they would desire i think that's a difficult one slightly um different area because to me it's um it would start with how they communicate uh, as well right um and but the heart of that is to know you know what it is you're selling and as we said before and and where that value lies mm -hmm. um to repeat to repeat a point and i think this is where it goes back to my sort of question to practitioners as has the percentage fee scale served you well? It, yeah. it hasn't because um, it's encouraged a, a sort of race to the bottom that, that's, that's around agreeing a fee that, that bears little resemblance to the resource that's required and you just hope that it's, it, it works for the best. Mm. And when you describe it that way, nobody would wish to build a business um, in that way, um, you would need to, uh, in a sense, work from the bottom up, um, understand where your break-even point is, understand your value. Um, and by all means, of course, communicate where it is that you can add value. But, but, I should, but then everybody else will be doing the same, we would hope. Um, but I think also the the other the flip side of that is to also to be possibly better at, at being more honest about the resource you commit to projects and and then thinking about managing it. There are certain things that are in the control of the market, um, and there are other things that are that, that we can control. And um, a significant part of the book um, is to do with monitoring and control. Yep. And how incremental changes to the way you manage your own resources can have a significant 
um, outcome to the bottom line. Yeah. Um, and of course, if you don't do that, then it really doesn't matter how high your fee is. You could have squandered it by managing the resources poorly. In the, yes. Uh, in in that chapter with the resourcing and systems for effective time management, what are some of the things that practices need to be doing? What are some of the specifics that actually help being able to allocate resource? So, so um, this really goes back to our advice that setting out your, your scope of service mm-hmm. um, at the outset as clearly as you can uh, is really important. Um, if you're doing a lot of domestic work, it's possible to have a sort of pro forma approach. We've seen that done very successfully. If it's more bespoke or larger projects, then inevitably it will become more complex. But um, I think the point we we wanted to make and, and, and what we gathered from, from the feedback from the delegates is that projects which start off with a great hope of being profitable end up not being profitable because things change. Mm. And so when things change, either it's because maybe the practice is, you know, wanting to win an award and has put an awful lot more work than probably is appropriate, but as Stephen says, it's going to help the portfolio. Yeah. But maybe it's the client has changed their mind. They'd added another three bedrooms. Um, they've asked you to look at another three sites. And of course, unless you set out what you propose to do at the outset, it's not so easy to go back and have a conversation. So the point we make in the book is that to to be be doing this monitoring, first of all, it gives you the raw data. I have spent 10 person days longer than I should have done getting planning. It then Mm -hmm. raises a number of questions. Why was that? And then you can, you've got a, 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 you've got a choice. You can either go back and have a, a discussion with the client saying, well, look, you made us do, we changed this, we changed this, it took us an awful lot of time. Or if it's a client that you really love working for and you know that's going to wind them up and you're just about to get the next job, you can take a view on it. But at least you're taking a view in full knowledge of Mm. what the implications of that is and month by month, because what's incredibly good bad manners is to sort of go back at the end and expect a client to sort of honour, you know, a lot of timesheets that you thrust in front of them because, you know, you've spent an awful lot more time. The point we make in the book, you've got to keep the client informed each month of where things stand. And if necessary, that is paving the way for a discussion later. Or maybe it isn't, but at least you're aware where you stand. If I can add to that, um, uh, is that the scope um, begins to determine the resources program for the project. Mm -hmm. And in the book, we put together um, really a a sort of what we call our method, which is a number of steps. And and Peter's absolutely right in that, you know, we've seen from many, many conversations with practitioners um, and also through um, our work in part three, getting a, a glimpse into how practices, many practices run their work that um, defining the scope is absolutely essential. Right. Um, But we also then say, again, continuing this theme of it's about time, that you put together a project resources program um, and you use that as a communication tool as well. Uh, Because, uh, you know, things do change. And um, yes, they may have an impact on fees. And no, they may not have an impact on fees, but at least you'll know where, where the conversation will, will start. Uh, and you'll also be able to do that in an informed way. Mm. Um, uh, and you know, unforeseen things occur. And, and we're doing this at a time when there's a lot of project uncertainty. That's the time when we're negotiating our fee. Um, But then, of course, the client is, in a way, relying on us, and this goes back to our value, to take them through this process, um, to act as their risk manager, um, to mitigate some of the risks as well. And in a sense, we owe it to them to to present them with this total program of where the project um, uh, will go and an estimate of of the timescales. 
I think the other point would be picking up on one of your earlier questions about putting your fees together mm -hmm. at the point of greatest uncertainty and therefore risk. We make the point in the book that um, feasibility studies, mm. a limited feasibility study, would allow you to determine many of the un unforeseen, many of the variables, many of the risks for a, r a limited and fixed figure, or certainly limited figure anyway, in terms of fees. And having established that viability and scope, then it's much easier to put forward a considered um, a fee proposal in an objective way. Um, so yes, it's very, very difficult. And, and, and we make the point in the book about the risk at various, uh, at various stages. That, that's a really good um, point and a very effective strategy. And I've spoken to many architects who have explained how you know doing a, a low cost consultation or a, a form of a feasibility study or a paid piece of a, appraisal work allows them to you know do the research that they might have done for free when trying to assess all the kind of project risks. Um, it also, from a marketing standpoint, you know once somebody's paid you, you know maybe a, a, a a kind of comparatively smaller fee to do this piece of work, they're much more likely as well to engage with you for the larger aspects of the of the project and and pay more money essentially. You know, once they've once they've bought something small from you, they're like more likely to buy something large from you. And it de-risks well, de-risks your your process as well. Stephen, I say, sorry, I was gonna say yes, it, it de-risks in a way because um, it's removing some of those uncertainties. It's also showing value. Um, as you say, it's a good marketing um, activity because it positions you with the client. But I think going back to your question about risk and uncertainty and the, the, one of the themes that we, we've um, developed is that this sort of work allows the client to understand more about the services you can provide mm -hmm. and also it allows you to also understand their expectations a little bit more clearly um, and uh, it's very likely that the reference points will change as a result of that study and um, uh, whatever type of work it might be as you say it could be um, uh, a single consultation or it could be a series of options all of which would be provided for um, you know, a fixed fee, but it allows everybody to to understand where this relationship is going to go. Yeah, the point I was um, going to make is um, about the feasibility studies, mm -hmm. is that um, if people are paying even a modest sum of money for your advice, they do tend to value it. And uh, although we didn't do that much on the small, really small scale, occasionally, um, if we had an inquiry via the RIBA, we always felt ab ab obliged to go out and meet this couple, um, and sit with them for the evening, listen to their woes and put forward a fee proposal. And of course, a lot of these people had obviously read in Homes and Gardens or something that an architect will come and give you free ideas, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, they could be seeing three architects. And so we actually had a policy of not giving any design ideas. We'd certainly tell them how we were going to work how we put our fee together, we tell them our methods of, of working. And, and um, But um, conversely, uh, we would often, um, with, a, with a relatively small client, offer to do a, a limited feasibility study. Now that feasibility study may only wash its face in terms of the amount of money you get for it. Yeah. But it does mean the client is not going to engage three architects to do the same thing. And they do actually value um, what you do for them. Yes. No. And, and, and again, like you say, it's a it's a great way of positioning yourself with with the client, and you can you can also, from a marketing perspective as well, turn that into a very compelling offer that lots of architects aren't doing. You know, this is this is, and it solves a particular set of pains or problems for the clients, which is again, you know, we're we're selling about, you know, you're 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 de-risking the process for them, in in many ways as well, and also kind of, it's a it's a lower it's a lower cost commitment for them. So it's an easier access or entry point into, into an engagement. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, if they don't, if they can, it's almost like a test drive as well. It's kind of like going on, going on a few dates before getting married. I think the, um, 
the flip side, and um, Stephen will remember this uh, a story from uh, when we were developing our, our series of fee lectures because we were using real life scenarios. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of work in the public sector. And so we very often get our work via feasibility studies. And it would really be in order to allow the institution to uh, bid for money from mm -hmm. central government. And once you'd established a principle, they would get their money and the job was a go and off you went. But more than once, we inadvertently took it so far with our feasibility study for a very modest sum. Mm -hmm. that it was virtually a planning application. <laughs> and then the client could simply take it away, have a, a fee beauty parade and get the thing, you know, submitted for planning for really not very much more money. And that's mm. the flip side. And of course, this is where it's very easy to give away these unique skills that you have for a relatively modest sum of money. So, yeah, just to keep keep a check on where you are in terms of the RIBA fee, um, work stages. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting point. Yes, you can kind of, again, over deliver in the feasibility study and then you've opened up yourself to being vulnerable to being shopped around. Uh, interesting point there that you bring up about working with institutions and public work. Um, what were some of the approaches or the challenges that you saw architects with setting fees with, you know, for, for public work where there's kind of, you know, OGU type processes and some of these institutions, it seems like they have people specifically employed to where their main role is to make sure that your fees are low as possible. Okay. So there's, there's two, there's two, crudely, there's two types of clients. Yeah. And of course, because I now work for university, I've got quite close to a lot of the people in the facilities departments and they're, you know, they're a great bunch of people and they take the pre-qualification questionnaires mm -hmm. and the quality threshold very, very seriously. And they really do, if it's a 60-40 split in terms of 60% fee, 40% quality, they take that quality very seriously. Right. They involve the stakeholders. And if the stakeholders like the cut, cut, cut of your jib and they like working with that particular team, then they will really make it possible for that to happen. So when it's done well, it's, it, you know, it's got many merits. Mm -hmm. However, there's also a considerable number of institutions who basically take the view that all architects are ARB registered, members of the RIBA, and have quality systems and therefore are equal. Mm -hmm. So you all get 100% on the quality threshold and it comes down to price. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly we have lost out to other practices putting in what I believe to be non-viable fees, way lower than we feel we could possibly um, do, either in the hope of getting in with a client that they haven't worked with before, or just simply because they haven't looked at what, what their real costs are. Very interesting. Stephen, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think it goes back to um, this point about knowing your client. Mm -hmm. And that starts with doing some research as well um, and it could be informal as well if that's possible about um, getting to know the facilities and estates teams the stakeholders that you may be engaged with um, uh, because if it is entirely about cost then you need to take a long hard look about that um, mm -hmm. as well and um, you know clients use and abuse their, their framework agreements. Um, but they are also under you know, uh, a, um, a duty to, to show that they've been through a competitive process, they've weighed up all their variables, of which cost might be the predominant one. Um, uh, but one would hope that it was about quality of delivery and the quality of, of outcome as well that fits into their particular business case. And I I see this as well, you know, with our estate work as well, um, uh, seeing a client side. Mm. Um, I think I'd just make a further point just uh, around the our conversation around feasibility studies as well. Yeah. But um, there is, of course, a temptation to see it as a marketing exercise. And, and for that reason, you might begin to um, see this as... Um, uh, as 
perhaps the cost, uh, the, va- the potential value exceeding the cost, when in fact, you know, the value may not. So that's a roundabout way of saying you throw too much at it because you are seeing it as a marketing exercise rather than um, one whereby you are providing a service. Yeah. Um, and of course, it falls into the same problem that if you don't monitor and value the time you commit, then then you're just facing the same issues that you would if you were mm. um, dealing with um, the project itself. Um, how important is it then to specialise in a niche and to be kind of perceived as an expert or a specialist? How much does that influence what architects can charge? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we're all we're all specialists in a way, you know. We we and, and that goes back to the heart of our value. But but most, if not all, sole practitioners and small practices generally operate in the same space, um, and um, so they're in competition with each other. Um, I mean, on one hand, you know, large practices can't compete in that space. Um, but we also know that at the other end, um, we get competition from, um, uh, I'm not going to call them architectural technologists necessarily. I, I certainly wouldn't want to um, say that they're not going to add value, but perhaps um, consultants who don't operate to the same professional standards, who don't have to have the same uh, rigorous education either mm-hmm. um, uh, but who know their way around the planning system so specializing in your geographical area can be a big advantage um, in winning work but it may not necessarily affect the fee it it will um, be a way of um, getting the job um, but providing a specialist service, would differentiate you from from other practices in your area. So, you know, examples would be a specialism in planning and um, a specialist in heritage and conservation or possibly energy performance. Um, So it's not entirely about getting a greater fee, but it um, allows you to differentiate yourself from the competition um, and, and possibly win the work as well. Yep. That's one aspect, as well as the specialist service elements where you do add value. I think um, often it, it seems to me that practitioners don't realise that they are actually a specialist. Uh, again, reading you know quite a few case studies People who do relatively modest or one-off houses well, uh, domestic projects, that's an incredible skill. Yeah. And it's slightly ironic that many people try and start their practice doing that type of work because it's incredibly hard. The clients are very demanding. They're very keen on the money side of things. And you know they really expect a very, very good service. And there are practices out there doing very well actually doing this type of work because they're set up for it. And yet sometimes when you speak to them and they're a little bit modest about what they're achieving because the projects themselves are modest. Mm-hmm. Um, our own practice um, does a lot of work for schools. And so because head teachers all speak to each other, we were well known in our geographical area and would normally yeah. get invited along um, because you know one head would say to another, well, these guys are are trustworthy. The actual projects themselves were not really rocket science, but having been a, a school governor myself of two institutions, I know how schools tick. I know the challenges facing head teachers and how governing bodies work. So although it's not a very glamorous specialism, it definitely was a specialism of our practice. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about as well. When we last spoke, um, you you mentioned Stephen. You mentioned as well a profit and surplus. What does what does that mean? Well, it's interesting. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about this with um, between ourselves, the publisher, 
with practitioners. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the point that is fundamental is that you need to know um, the point where you will be making a surplus. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've, you haven't got the, re- the systems in place to understand your cost base, then, then it, you'll never really understand where and how and when you're, uh, you're generating a surplus. Um, but the point I think that one needs to drive home is that this is essential for reinvestment in yourself, um, you know, your own uh, personal growth as a sole practitioner, for example, yeah. you know, the time required to gain new skills. Um, we're going to be under immense pressure to um, demonstrate our competence uh, more uh, more clearly in the very near future, particularly around fire safety and climate change. Mm-hmm. Um, and that needs resource. It needs time. And you can only do that in your non-chargeable time. Um, um, but it's important also to invest in your staff and possibly invest in growth and also to build up funds to allow you to grow. Um, so the fundamentals, though, are really understanding where your costs are and then building on that. Um, Peter, well, we've I, had a lot I, of conversations. Of course, in, um, in the current climate, you know, um, the whole business of having some slack in the system, uh, some bunts to deal with the hard times has really mm. you know, come to the fore. And I think generally speaking, many small and sole practitioners are, you know, undercapitalized. And because we're always paid in arrears um, on the whole. And so we need working capital to um, survive. And obviously this profit is the only way in which we can build up surplus um, in order to uh, give us freedom to make decisions. Um, if you want to invest in a new software system or, or I don't know, consider your own development, you have much more choice if you have, if it's your money as opposed to you're borrowing the money. Um, and so this all comes back to um, your cash reserves. And obviously that only comes from profit. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, what are your you know, to kind of begin to wrap up the, the the conversation, if you were to give you know one piece of advice to uh, a young practice starting out, how to manage their profit and surplus, what would you recommend that they do? Well, I okay, I'll I'll jump in here. Um, I'll I suppose is to um, stick to the basics, understand. Um, where your costs lie, mm. um, record those costs, record your time. Um, the, there's a tendency when you start um, to think that you'll do certain things and put certain systems in place when you get bigger. Yeah. Um, I have to say when I moved from large commercial practice to starting a specialist consultancy, we took the view that we were a a large practice that happened to be small. And the the reason we said that was that it meant that we spent a long time putting systems in place Mm -hmm. um, and that we operated with the same rigor um, that we would have done uh, whatever our size. And and that, of course, allowed us to have those systems in place when we did grow. Um, It wasn't a series of shocks. Um, so I wouldn't put off um, getting those systems. And it's not, as Peter would say, rocket science. It's, it's um, one of the key things we wanted to get across uh, was that you don't need very, very expensive software systems to do this. Um, it's about the discipline as much yeah. as anything else. Um, but also having the mindset that you were clear about where your value lay. And as Peter said, you know, with with many small practices, they do add extreme value on complex small projects. um, 
which they don't always articulate very well. Mm. Um, and the marketing tends to be thought of being something else that you do, but it's actually you know, an integral part of your message. Um, yeah. And it's about your position. Uh, but, it, but you would, could be in the danger of growing too fast and running out of money um, uh, or taking a lot of work and, and finding that you're not actually um, being paid enough, you know, that you might have been better off not doing the work in the first place. <laughs> um, uh, or in an um, extreme example, you know, you're effectively giving your service away. Um, so it's, it's really, it's about understanding those principles, um, and also understanding your value. Brilliant. Yeah. I think the difficulty for, um, any young practitioners starting off and trying to start their own practice is, you know, it's, it's very, very challenging and you're much better making your mistakes working for somebody else. I mean, I have to say that I'd been a partner of my practice for two years uh, before I really understood the significance of, you know, profitability. Mm -hmm. We did normally look at cash flow forecast six months ahead, and we did a sort of project review. So I was lucky because my practice has been going 150 years, and so I was sort of nurtured into it. Mm. But um, these are things that aren't really taught, certainly not in schools of architecture very much. And, of course, when they are taught at part three level, you know, it's, well, that's a long way off. Mm. But these business things are terribly important. And as, as, as um, Stephen says, you know, needn't be complex the simplest spreadsheet will do uh, if you're starting off and the other thing is to is realistic targets to set yourself realistic targets not super glamorous targets that show you're going to be you know earning a fortune in the next two years um, and have an idea where that where that where that work can come from brilliant i think that's the the perfect yes. place to to conclude the conversation and i'd just like to say peter and stephen thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experience and the vast amount of knowledge that you've uh, acquired through you know, your own researches and and working in practices and and of course a, a plug for the book for people to go and check it out it's called fees by peter farrell and stephen brookhouse and it's available from ruba publishing so thank you thank you and that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.